This episode of Tech News Day is sponsored by Mac Weldon. All right, listen, we've been trying as best we can to not turn into the dumb NFT news show. But this week, there's just so much goddamn dumb, non-fungible token news that we can't just hide the NFT crap at the end of the episode. It's got to happen right now. You have to understand where we're coming from here. This is a tech show, and for whatever reason, it is not our desire for this to happen. Yeah. But, but we didn't choose for the tech industry to try to make Web3 happen. No, they're just they went ahead and did it. forcefully trying to for absolutely no reason. So every new thing that happens is in some way related to stupid ass tokenomics, Web3, or NFTs. And yeah, I'm sick of it too. But some of it's very funny because it keeps blowing up in people's faces. Yeah. And maybe if we make fun of it long enough together, all together, something might happen. Yeah. Anyway. There's chapters in the video if you really got a problem with any of that. You can skip around. But uh, for everyone else who's ride or die, thank you. Let's just get right into the latest huge NFT project to completely screw over its customers. And this time, it's an NFT project that seemed as legit as could be. Or at least as legit as any other celebrity endorsed NFT project. Legendary rock star Ozzy Osbourne announced Crypto Bats last month. And as NFTs go, this all seemed very on the level. Osborne had teamed up with established players in the NFT space and even released a video in which he and his wife Sharon <laughs> dropped all the right NFT insider buzzwords. NGMI, probably nothing, all that crap. Good morning. But just two days after launching, a bunch of crypto bass holders got scammed out of a bunch of money. Oh my god. Who could have seen this coming? Uh, here's The Verge with the breakdown on this particular scam. Like the majority of NFT projects, CryptoBats uses Discord as a place to organize its community. The official CryptoBats Discord is now accessed through the short link discord.gg slash CryptoBats. But previously, the project used a slightly different vanity URL at discord.gg slash CryptoBats NFT. When the project switched to the new URL, scammers set up a fake Discord server at the old one. But neither CryptoBats nor Ozzy Osbourne took the precaution of deleting tweets referencing the previous URL, meaning that old tweets from Osbourne himself were left directing followers to a server that was now controlled by scammers. <laughs> One tweet from CryptoBats posted on December 31st, 2021 received more than 4,000 retweets and hundreds of replies. The tweet was only removed on January 21st after CryptoBats was contacted by The Verge. <laughs> hey, you guys seeing this? On clicking the scam link, the invite panel for the fake Discord showed the total number of members as 1,330, an indication of the number of people who could potentially have been fooled by the scam. Inside the server, a bot spoofing community management service Collabland asked users to verify their crypto assets to participate in the server. Wallet inspector, get out those wallets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the wallet inspector. Oh, there you go. Uh, but uh, instead directed users to a phishing site where they were prompted to connect their cryptocurrency wallets. Um, this is also out of the realm of normal uh, activity for even a legitimate server. Yeah. Uh, so this was, th and herein lies an even bigger problem is that celebrities are putting their names uh, and look, I don't know how much people trust Kim Kardashian or Ozzy Osbourne, but there are no shortage of people that actually do. Mm -hmm. And they're putting their name on something and saying like, this is fine. This is um, on the level. This is legit. That's a Kardashian promise. But So people who aren't as familiar with being involved in crypto in any way and are just mm -hmm. instead a fan of the time that uh, Ozzy bit the head off of a bat, uh, are going in here and think that this is legit and think that the wallet inspector is a real thing mm -hmm. like the nerds at oh. Springfield University. Oh, wallet inspector. Oh, well, why, yes. Here's my crypto wallet. Have a look. You will find that I am, in fact, a legitimate holder of... Hold on. Where'd all my coins go? Um, yeah. So... It sucks, but they have to be more proactive about this. Yeah. Especially if you're behind the 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 scenes on this. Blockchain like not deleting does not lie. Not deleting old tweets with bad links. And and the other thing that can get uh, that was probably abused in this scenario is the fact that the fact that the the old tweets even existed. Mm -hmm. Not that they weren't currently getting pushed by Osborne himself, but as we've seen with these NFT communities in general, they will go and brigade certain tweets to get them higher on people's feeds and more likes and retweets. So the scammers just probably went to this tweet and created a bunch of Twitter accounts or got all of their friends together and like, retweet this tweet so that it appears higher than an actual new Aussie tweet when referring to crypto bats. It's brilliant. Yeah. Very clever, yeah. very easy. 
Very easy. <laughs> so how much money did these scammers make off with? Uh, thankfully, not a whole lot. It sounds like individual victims lost a few hundred dollars, and the Ethereum wallet linked to the scammers pulled in around $41,000 total. Which is a lot, but it's pretty small by crypto scam standards. Yeah. Pretty pretty good haul overall, though, considering that this is an official, this is an officially licensed celebrity NFT project that had just launched, like a day and a half earlier. Mm -hmm. And it's all because CryptoBats changed its Discord URL without deleting old posts referencing the old URL. All right. So clearly, this is their fucking fault. Yes. Are they at least taking responsibility for this little goof? Of course they're not. Why would they? This is all Discord's fault. Gotta be. Uh, here's The Verge again. Asked whether the project should accept responsibility for leaving the old link online, Sutter Systems, developers of the CryptoBats NFT, laid blame for the scam squarely with Discord. In an email statement to The Verge, Sutter Systems co-founder Jepeji uh, emphasized that the compromise was only possible because of the easy setup and maintenance of the scam Discord instance. Quote, Although we feel very sorry for the people that have fallen prey to these scams, we cannot take responsibility for the actions of scammers exploiting Discord, a platform that we have absolutely no control over, GPEGI said. In our opinion, this situation and hundreds of others that have taken place across other projects in the NFT space could have easily been prevented if Discord just had a better response slash support slash fraud team in place to help big projects like ours. I take no responsibility. And, and now, uh, okay, look, all companies should have better security and better security and customer service teams. But the fact that like just Discord has been used by all of these yeah. NFT projects. It's, it's Discord's responsibility to uh, watch out for the rampant scams inherent to our business. Yes. It's their responsibility. And, and not even reactive, proactive responsibility. Yeah. And it's ridiculous. like, yeah, their security measures could be a lot better, sure. But this is just like the most obfuscation of guilt thing ever. It's a it's a it's Discord for gamers or it's a it's Slack for gamers. It's, it's a chat app for uh, talking to people while you play video games. Yes. You're asking a, a gamer chat service to uh, protect you from fraud that's inherent in what you're doing. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, I mean I sure it could probably be wise for Discord to make it so that recently used URLs can't immediately be reused. Sure. But that's a it's pretty stupid to assume that that's already the case. I mean when you change your Twitter handle, that handle immediately becomes available for someone else to use. Mm -hmm. You would think that the supposedly tech savvy people behind a project like this would know better, but mm, no. Anyway, in case you're wondering about the art, here you go. They're Pixelated cartoon bats, all in the same pose, but featuring different colors and hats and shit. Same old, same old. Yeah. People seem to be trying to sell them for around $6,000 a pop these days, but they're only really going for around half that much, and the sale prices have steadily been on the decline since CryptoBats launched last week. Maybe that's just due to the overall uh, slump in Ethereum prices and just crypto prices in general, or maybe that's just people... Uh, Bought the hype, and now they're like, well, all I have is a fucking bat. I don't know. Uh, and look, the crypto might back, bounce back. It probably will over the long term, just like yeah. the stock market. But it is it is funny. It is funny that right when the Crypto.com arena gets its name changed from Staples Center, uh, right before Snoop Dogg's about to do a uh, NFT cameo in the Super Bowl halftime show, uh, right when Matt Damon is all over your TVs telling you, that risk gets the reward. Favor, fortune, or fortune favors the bold, or whatever the fuck he yeah. says. Like, at the pinnacle of getting the mainstream into crypto, it just nosedives. Yeah, it's especially funny. A couple, uh, a couple athletes mm -hmm. have uh, chosen to take their salary in Bitcoin. Bad idea now. Uh, so now they're gonna owe taxes on the original value in dollars mm -hmm. of what they got paid, but what they actually have is significantly less. Yeah, I don't know if that is goes into effect till 2023, but uh, either way, they are losing money on the deal. Yeah. It's about, oh, the mayor of New York. Uh oh. There Eric, you go. Eric Adams, he bungled it again. That what a bungler this, in the yeah, first month. He's, uh, <laughs> Eric Adams is the perfect New York mayor. Yeah. The the bungler, uh, <laughs> Bill the bungler. I mean, he he bungled a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, my favorite being when he uh, was wearing sunglasses and it looked like he was staring. At a woman's big old milkers, <laughs> um, but uh, Eric Adams is just like he is—he's speed running 
the debungler uh, arc. He is just bungling shit every day. He is a he like, is a wonderful. He's at the Knicks games on MLK Junior Day, being like, Martin Luther King. <laughs> he knew that in order to make the play, you needed to have the ball in your hand or some shit like that. It's incredible. He's great. He's like Boris Johnson for New York. He is. Yeah. He's the mayor that New York deserves. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, yeah. Wow. You might be thinking Web three is going just great. Mm-hmm. And Web3 is going just great is also the name of a great website that we came across that documents things of this nature in a convenient chronological format. Uh, often it's stuff we hadn't even heard about because it hasn't even garnered a write-up in the mainstream tech press yet. Like this one here at the top. Let's go Brandon coin touted by Steve Bannon suddenly drops 50% in value. Good stuff. Uh, its website also has all sorts of filters that let you sort posts by blockchain, by whether it's NFTs or DAOs or cryptocurrency or whatever, and by themes like Bad idea, hacker scam, and rug pull. There's even a convenient little total in the bottom right corner that adds up the total amount of money that people lost in each of these scams mm -hmm. as you scroll, which adds up to over $90 million if you just scroll back to the beginning of January. It's a fun website. Uh, anyways, a great website and Twitter account to follow if uh, coiners taking L isn't scratching your schadenfreude itch enough. But uh, what else have they got from the past week or so? Oh, here's a good one. Promised NFT game Blockverse rug pulls 500 ETH, $1.2 million. Blockverse, a project that promised to build a play-to-earn game on top of Minecraft, rug pulled two days after launch. The initial NFT collection sold out in only eight minutes, even though the project creators hadn't even begun to develop the game they were promising. The creators rug pulled two days later, taking the 500 ETH, or $1.2 million, and deleting the project website and Discord server. See you gamer dorks later. Yeah, and honestly, anyone willingly spending money to support play to earn gaming and getting scammed in the process gets no sympathy here whatsoever. Games are supposed to be fun, and you're trying to turn that shit into a job. Fuck that. Unless it's American Truck Simulator. Yeah. Or Euro Truck Simulator, or the various amounts of training simulators. We don't need virtual truckers. We need real truckers. Yeah. Well... Only if you're 18. My, need, my economy is in trouble. My favorite part of that story is that uh, autonomous truck driving is a, not an immediate future, but very near. So they're just ruining the potential like long-term business goals of a bunch I, of 18-year-olds. I don't think uh, level, what is it? Tier, four, five. Tier four. Yeah. I don't think it's coming. It's one of those things that the more they, the more they work on it, the more they realize uh, how difficult it is. We it's should just the, build trains. The unknown, More trains. unknowns. Yeah, like, uh, here's an idea. Imagine if all of those big rigs you see on the interstate were all just connected together in one dedicated sort of uh, uh, thoroughway or whatever, cause whatever the word would be for that. And um, not only that, and stacking, had its, stacking multiple trucks stacking on top of themselves. Stacking multiple trucks on top of each other, no traffic, just A to Z uh, with a few stops in between. Imagine. Crazy. Mm. Anyway, uh, here's more on the Blockverse rug pull from UK outlet NME. On January 23rd, Blockverse launched their public sale of 10,000 NFTs that would enable owners access to a play-to-earn Minecraft server, allowing for teamwork and competition. Diamonds are generated through combat and playtime, reads their white paper. Costing 0.05 Ethereum, 97 pounds, to mint, all the tokens sold out in eight minutes. However, shortly after that, the Blockverse Discord shut down, as did their official website, and their Twitter account hasn't posted since announcing the sellout in what fans are now calling a rug pull. But while rug pulls are the most malicious and flagrant scams in the NFT space, there's also plenty of stuff like what happened with Ozzy Osbourne, where accidental human error ends up costing people a whole lot of money. And that's the case with another story that we found on Web3 is going just great. People losing their bored apes due to a glitch in NFT marketplace OpenSea in which canceled sale listings weren't actually canceled. Now here's the record explaining this little oopsie. A threat actor has exploited a vulnerability in the back end of OpenSea, the internet's largest NFT marketplace, to buy products at previous lower prices and then resell them at higher values, defrauding legitimate asset owners. At the time of writing, the attacker has made at least 332 Ether, or $745,000, by exploiting this vulnerability, according to blockchain security firm PeckShield. The issue was initially discovered by Rotom Yakir, a software developer at DeFi platform Orbs. Yakir found that while users could put up NFTs for sale on OpenSea and then later cancel listings and update them with a new price, the previous NFT listing with the old price could still be accessed through the OpenSea API, even if it had been removed from the main web portal. 
In a Twitter thread, Yakir blamed the issue on OpenSea's decision to manage some of its listings using a dual on-chain and off-chain setup, which left some gaps in how some of its listings were being treated. So basically, you know how the blockchain is supposed to be this totally accurate ledger that's always up to date? Well, it is, but it's also, of course, extremely inefficient. So to save on gas fees, OpenSea apparently does a lot of its operations off-chain. What? So OpenSea's ledger isn't always in sync with the actual blockchain ledger. Basically, one of the premier Web3 services uses Web2 because actually fully relying on Web3 would cost them too much money. And as a result, you get sad bastards like this guy, Twitter user T-Baller. Guys, why did my ape just sell for 0.77? Guys, I might be out of Board Ape Yacht Club forever for what just happened. It's rough to say, but I can't financially afford that loss. I might have to list the crown cheetah. Can someone please help me get the laurel ape back to me? Or is it down forever? So, okay. Web3, going just great. Going just great. And speaking of Twitter users with NFTs, last week we talked about how Twitter now supports NFT profile pictures, complete with a hexagon border to let everyone know that this person actually owns the NFT. They're not just some right-click save poser pretending to own F NFTs that they actually don't own. Well, surprise. Right-click saving is still alive and well. Mm. It's slightly more complicated now, but it's still pretty damn easy to make someone else's NFT your Twitter profile pic and even get the hexagon around it. Cool. Now here's some bored ape guy explaining. There's actually a major problem with the new Twitter PFP feature. It appears to work for any NFT in your collection, not just verified collections. That means someone can just right-click save any NFT, mint it, and then use it as their profile picture. Sad face. You were so close, Twitter. Why? Well, this obviously sounds like a job for the NFT police. Mm -hmm. Let me see the. Let me see that wallet. Yeah, the wa up. literally the wallet inspector. Yeah. That, that's going to be. Your, that was a joke twenty years ago, and it's becoming a reality. And I hate it. <laughs> I love it, kind of. I mean, <laughs> I, I hate that we've reached this point, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and also, like that. That's the thing. It's like so annoying about. Like everyone's just like, oh, well, these guys. Well, they make fun of the the JPEG art version of NFTs when the real future is you know concert tickets. And uh, deeds, a bunch and of things contracts. I can already do just as easily without the blockchain. Yeah, it is. Again, look, sure, maybe I don't know. I guess, but uh, things have been going fine for a while now with all of that stuff. Yeah, that's the thing. And and like, also, why are you giving more power to like Ticketmaster? They they already have a, a system in place where they get paid like five times for every ticket that's sold or resold. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Mashable reporter Jack Morse demonstrated this uh, cool new trick in an article. He wrote, Approximately 24 hours after Twitter announced the new hexagonal NFT profile pic feature, I was able to get a CryptoPunk lookalike NFT as my official Twitter profile picture, hexagonal and all. The process was relatively straightforward. It required taking an image, in this case some pixel art styled after CryptoPunks that I made in MS Paint, uploading it to the NFT marketplace Rarible, and minting it onto the Ethereum blockchain by sending it to a cryptocurrency wallet I control. Then I simply had to link the NFT to my Twitter account. While this pixelated image is merely in the style of CryptoPunks, there would be nothing to stop someone from right-click saving official board apes or CryptoPunks and doing the same thing. What's that sound I heard? It's Jimmy Jimmy Fallon fighting someone over his stealing his that's board ape. That's a stolen ape. <laughs> hey, hey, get back here. Give back. That's not your ape. That's my ape. <laughs> he paid like two hundred fifty thousand dollars for that ape. Yeah, that's what. Way. When people were like, "These apes are enough to feed a family for a week," I was like, "No, try mm -hmm. years." Yeah. 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 Like, insanity. Insanity. Anyways, as you've noticed by now, most NFTs are absolutely tasteless aesthetically. But uh, we've seen plenty of examples of NFTs that are also tasteless in other ways, like the Bob Ross and Stan Lee NFT cash grabs. But um, you ready for a new low? Remember back in 2015 when a bunch of terrorists showed up at the Bataclan music venue in Paris and murdered 130 people? Uh, it's still one of the most horrific mass casualty events in recent memory. But one survivor of the attack recently had the pleasure of discovering that an x-ray of her bullet-ridden arm was being sold as an NFT by the surgeon who operated on her. So this has multiple layers of fucked up to it. Uh, first off, he is exploiting a horrific tragedy for profit. Uh, but secondly, this is a medical doctor just blatantly violating the most basic ethical guidelines of his profession. So the NFT listing even included the information in the description that the arm belonged to a young woman whose boyfriend was killed in the attack. Jesus. And now the NFT sale 
has been pulled due to all this controversy. Uh, the woman's probably going to sue, and she's got a pretty good case. And also, this doctor is probably going to face criminal prosecution and maybe even lose his ability to practice medicine. So, hope it was worth it, jackass. Uh, it's completely blowing up in his face, and uh, good fucking riddance. But speaking of good riddance, uh, with Facebook's latest pivot to metaverse stuff and all their various scandals over the past couple of years, we've all kind of forgotten that at one point they were trying to get into the cryptocurrency space with something called Libra, which later had its name changed to DM uh, because Facebook's Libra plans received so much backlash. Uh, it, was, it, it wasn't the worst idea. I mean, it was, it was pitched as a stable blockchain-based alternative to stuff like Western Union and Venmo. But the Facebook Association was a pretty clear deal breaker for most yeah. people. Uh, and the project has been in a mostly dormant state for a while after a bunch of big partners like Visa and MasterCard bailed. Uh, and now it sounds like it might be fully dead. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, here's Ars Technica. After years of effort, Meta's cryptocurrency initiative has collapsed under the weight of regulatory scrutiny. The DM Association, formerly known as the Libra Association, is considering selling its assets and returning money to investors, according to a Bloomberg report. There's not much to sell, though. The company doesn't have much in the way of physical assets, just some intellectual property. Perhaps the most valuable part of the association is its engineers. DM is reportedly looking for a new home for them. The final nail in the coffin came when Federal Reserve officials said they weren't sure if they would allow the bank affiliated with the project to issue the stablecoin. Libra slash DM, faced with the specter of a regulatory crackdown, had reached the end of the road. Meta still owns about a third of the DM association, according to the Bloomberg report. Other members were supposed to pay in, though it's not clear how many, if any, did. Imagine suing a company and being like, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have any money, we just, but we do. what we do have is plenty of intellectual property that was never used, um, which is, I think, more valuable. Invaluable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Can't put a price on intellectual property. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, but... Yeah, if it was something like Mickey Mouse, <laughs> yeah. but not something that never launched. I saw a great thing, uh, I don't know who said it, but they're like, everyone should start minting NFTs of Mickey Mouse. Yeah. And that'll shut this whole thing down. Lickety split. Or uh, NFTs of the Prophet Muhammad. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. You really want this to stop? What about Mickey Mouse as Muhammad? Or Mickey and Muhammad hanging out together? Well, someone out there is bound to do it. I'm going to start a collection of 10,000 variations on Mickey Mouse and Muhammad uh, hanging out. We should stop this conversation right now. All right. Yeah, one last crypto story, though, before we finally move on to other things. Uh, a little update on Jimmy Fallon's uh, little Bored Ape segment on his show that we talked about in our previous episode. If you missed it, basically, Jimmy Fallon and Paris Hilton talked about how much they love their Bored Apes, while the audience just kind of sat there thinking, I guess this is what rich people are into. <laughs> For me, no, I'll, I'll keep the live, laugh, love sign hanging yeah. above the door. Yeah. Um, but the LA Times looked into it further and concluded that Jimmy Fallon may have actually been in breach of his parent company's ethics guidelines by essentially hyping up an NFT project on his show, which is literally what I said on the last episode. I was like, I think that maybe NBC should have a problem with this because he's kind of pitching a pyramid scheme on their network. So uh, good to see someone just picked at that thread a little bit. Uh, here's from the uh, the article that we previously mentioned. Digital sleuths have deduced that Fallon probably purchased the primate pick last November for about $216,000, or rather purchased a record on a digital blockchain ledger saying he owns it. Hyping it up on his show may well boost its asking price even higher if he ever tries to resell it, which is where things get tricky. A workplace policy set out by Comcast, the parent company of The Tonight Show, Network NBC, asks employees to not let outside interests or activities interfere with their business judgment or response to the company. Another policy within NBC Universal mandates that all employees disclose and obtain approval for all outside work, financial interests, and other personal activities slash relationships that may create or appear to create a conflict. The same policy says that employees should not use company info, resources, time, etc. for personal benefit. If Fallon's use of Showtime to flex his ape were to boost its resale value, it would seemingly be a case of using company resources for personal benefit. So NBC, they told the Times, though, that Jimmy Fallon was in the clear here because hosts are allowed to promote outside projects such as books and movies. Though, as the article points out, a bored ape is neither of those things and is just a financial asset whose value is closely tied to promotion from influencers like Jimmy Fallon. And one could argue that what Fallon did isn't very different than if he dedicated a segment to hyping up Tesla stock or something like that. But uh, NBC doesn't see it that way, at least for now. Um, the article did have one very interesting revelation, though. Apparently, Ben McKenzie, the actor known for shows like The O.C. and Gotham, 
has gotten really into crypto, except unlike most of his fellow celebrities, he's taken the exact opposite approach and become a prominent NFT skeptic. He must have got burned. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but this fucking rules. Ryan from the OC, I, yeah. I always knew he was a good one. Yeah, he uh, he probably had like a lazy lion or something stolen from him. Uh, and he had he's, like a weird name on Twitter. Like he's a, made it his fucking mission. To yes, take he is down, a anti-NFT superhero. <laughs> he's uh, the Commissioner Gordon of the NFT world. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's the article. I don't love the idea of luring people in thinking they're going to get wealthy off of trading NFTs. Actor Ben McKenzie said, the former star of the OC and Gotham has recently been campaigning against aspects of the celebrity endorsed crypto economy. McKenzie noted that plugging stuff is what talk shows are for, but said the addition of financial speculation on top of that concerns him. Quote, if everything were transparent, then I think that might be one thing, McKenzie said. But given how opaque these markets are and how easily they can be manipulated through means that would be illegal in regulated markets, I'm not wild about it. And I'm not wild about, quite frankly, Jimmy Fallon using his show to promote it. I don't see there's any negative intent by him, but in times of a bubble, like the one we're in, speculation runs rampant. And people, unfortunately, historically speaking, they end up spending money that they think they have. Eventually, the tide goes up. And yeah, Ben McKenzie isn't just doing his anti-NFT celebrity thing casually. Looking at his Twitter feed, you'd never even guess this guy's main profession is acting. Uh, he even has a monthly column on Slate uh, that's now dedicated to crypto and NFT scams. The man seems to have spent a lot of time looking into this stuff, probably more time than any of the celebrities that are actually shilling blockchain projects have done. So good for him. Uh, we love you, Ben McKenzie. Yeah, it's refreshing. I, I hadn't thought about him in a while. I always liked him as an actor. It's uh, I loved the OC. Yeah, I, I was, and and uh, it's fun. I was embarrassingly, embarrassingly yeah, addicted to everyone. The OC. I, it, so this was especially true. I'm from Orange County. Yeah. When they first announced that show, everyone was like, "Fuck this show!" No one, first of all, no one calls it the OC. Now they do because of the fucking show. They used to just call it OC. There was no the. So we were like. What are these people, these Hollywood, these city slickers up in L.A. think they, they know what Orange County is about and they can't even get the name right? Like, what is this shit? And the show is, is very... It's trash. It's very inaccurate. It's, yeah. it, like, it has nothing... It is a soap opera. Yeah. It was a, it was a primetime soap opera. Yeah, and it got real bad after a couple seasons. But, mm -hmm. yeah, once it started, it was like, oh, man, this is actually pretty good. Yeah. A poor boy from Chino yeah. going all the way to Newport Beach <laughs> yeah. to make it big. Yeah. Wow. How is he going to fit in with these high schoolers? Oh, the, they're from the same county, but from different worlds. He's going to have some trouble. Uh, yeah. So good good for Ben McKenzie. Uh, I also think it, uh, I feel like if you dug a little bit deeper, maybe he did buy it. But this also could be an asset that's actually owned by N uh, NBC that was purchased for his show. Mm. I mean, maybe, but... I don't see how that would Jimmy change Fallon's anything, but got still. millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and, yeah. yeah. This is just the latest rich guy trend. Steph Curry, all these fucking... I, Gwyneth Paltrow Steph just... Steph Curry can do whatever he wants. Gwyneth Paltrow just bought a fucking ape. Like, it's just... It's the new status symbol. It's... These people have no problems is, Does the lives. ape smell like her vagina? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta apply the mutant serum. <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, we've got the non-NFT news half of the show coming up in just a second. But first, a word from our sponsor who deals in physical goods. Yes. And they feel great. Fungible physical goods. Yes. Uh, that is, of course, Mac Weldon. Now, it's no secret that we all want to look our best this winter, right? Mac Weldon is the expert when it comes to essential clothing that's perfect for the cold. Whether you need a legit warm shirt or are looking to upgrade your sweats collection, Mac Weldon has exactly what you're looking for. And if that's not convenient enough, let me tell you about Mac Weldon's daily wear system. All the clothes work together, for real. So whether you're headed to work, going for a run, or just hanging on the couch, getting dressed takes no effort at all. All of your winter wardrobe needs are covered here, and if you're like us, you are sure to become something of a collector of these comfy <laughs> clothes. Mack Weldon's Ace sweatpants and sweatshirts are not your average sweats. You will love how insanely soft they are, plus they're nice enough to wear to the store or cruise the neighborhood with. That's what I love about Mack Weldon the most, is uh, you can pretend you're not being lazy. Yes. And in fact, you were being extremely lazy. Nobody knows. And uh, if you're like us, you love the feel of warm clothes, but absolutely hate to sweat. Gross. Mack Weldon's warm knit collection uses your body temperature to keep you warm without the weight. It's almost as if it was made just for me and you. Mm -hmm. Us and sweaty boys. <laughs> if it's time to give that top drawer an annual refresh with new underwear and new styles, no one does underwear like Mack Weldon. They literally have a pair with technical fabrics for every single activity in our routine. Check out Mack Weldon for yourself and save 20% on your first order. Visit MacWeldon.com slash Newsday and enter promo code Newsday. Again, that is MacWeldon.com slash Newsday with promo code Newsday for 20% off. Find your perfect look 
for this winter. Literally the best underwear I've ever owned. I will never go back to yeah. anything else. You should really treat yourself. Uh, yeah. I, there's there's definitely been days at this point where I'm I'm fully decked out. Mac welding head full, to toe. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Anyway, back to the news now with a, a little COVID-19 update. And uh, yeah, things are still going real bad. Mm -hmm. But uh, at least the stock market and the crypto crashes seem to have spilled over into the U.S.'s COVID case numbers because they are apparently back on the decline after peaking at 800,000 new cases per day earlier this month. Now it's closer to 600,000, which is an improvement, but yeah. still more than double the winter 2021 peak. Mm -hmm. So bad. Uh, hospitalizations, which generally lag a week or two behind cases, are also, I don't know, maybe starting to decline from their all-time peak as well. And we should point out for the millionth time that while the vaccines are not silver bullets against COVID, they're not magic, unvaccinated people are still twice as likely to get the virus and 20 times as likely to die from it. So I don't know. Do with that what you will. Yeah, but let's say you want a little extra protection on top of your vaccine doses. Well, disclaimer, this is not medical advice, but it's looking like the stoners may have been on to something that whole, this whole time about cannabis being uh, God's all-purpose medicine because <laughs> multiple recent studies have suggested a pretty strong link between cannabis and COVID-19 prevention. The first study published earlier this month in the peer-reviewed Journal of Natural Products by researchers from Oregon State University and Oregon Health and Sciences University found that two non-psychoactive compounds found in cannabis, CBGA and CBDA, prevented human cells from being infected by multiple variants of the virus. Now, to be clear, both of these compounds are precursors that can't actually be inhaled when smoking cannabis. A CBGA is only present while the plant is growing, and CBDA turns into regular old CBD when heat is applied. So they would both have to be extracted in some way and then ingested orally to possibly have the same effects on a person as they did on the cells in the study. Uh, and it's also unfortunate that the researchers really wanted to test out THCA, but couldn't get enough of it due to it being considered a controlled substance. But overall, this seems like this might have serious potential as a like daily supplement that you can take to lower your chances of infection. Although by the time this passes review, we'll be on to the next virus. Who knows? Yeah. But maybe it'll work on that one too. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, there's also multiple studies showing that just regular old CBD could help against COVID infection. Could. Could. Susan, don't strike the video. We're just reading the news. A study out of Canada's University of Waterloo found that synthetic CBD basically primes and activates the antiviral response of cells to the COVID virus, making them more prepared if COVID infection does occur. Another study from researchers at the University of Chicago and the University of Louisville looked at 1,200 U.S. patients already taking prescribed CBD and found that their COVID-19 infection rate was lower than control groups with similar medical background who did not take CBD. But again, this is early research. Yeah. Uh, Seems pretty promising. We're definitely not saying that weed cures COVID or anything like that. No. That is not what we're saying. No. But hopefully there will be more and more research into these properties of cannabis. Um, That's why I get the gummies that have uh, the equal parts CBD and THC. It's uh, nice and mellow and uh, keeps me safe. Yeah. And also keeps me on the couch and away from other people yeah. uh, who could potentially spread the virus to me. Yeah. They could be a bad influence. And they could have COVID. It's so weird. We found that all these people that stay in their houses smoking weed, uh, they, they're not getting COVID. I wonder why. Protect yourself and protect your friends and neighbors. By Smoke isolating. Weed. <laughs> By isolating <laughs> and just getting high and eating. Uh, but yeah, yeah they, and like these studies also suggest uh, potential that like these compounds could be, like it's not just COVID. Like they could just have antiviral properties yeah, in general. Maybe. Which is crazy. Like, but... We're so far behind. It's, it's very, very frustrating to realize that for decades, science pretty much turned a blind eye to any potential legitimate medicinal uses of cannabis and the compounds in it due to it being a fucking illegal drug. And yeah, now we're decades behind. If, if these antiviral properties had maybe been studied sooner, we might all be better off for it in a lot of ways, not just in terms of this pandemic. But, uh, you know, that's all just part of the legacy of the war on drugs, which last time I checked, the drugs seemed to be winning. Yeah. Handily. They are kicking everything's ass. And in a good way. Yeah. In a lot of cases. Yeah. Some cases bad. Some. Mm -hmm. But moving on from the war on drugs to actual war, or at least potential war, Russia sure seems like they're ready to invade Ukraine. Or at least that's the impression they want to give everyone else. And sending Russian troops to Ukraine involves a whole lot of cooperation from the nation of Belarus, whose borders provide a much more convenient path towards the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. Uh, but not everyone in Belarus is down with their country's pro-Russia stance, 
And some hacktivists in Belarus are claiming to have done something that blurs the line between hacktivism and ransomware. They say that they've infected the network of Belarus's state-run railroad system with ransomware and will only provide an encryption key if Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, stops helping the Russians and also releases 50 political prisoners. So this group, cyber partisans, wrote on Telegram, uh, Bell ZHD, which is Belarus's railroad system, at the command of the terrorist Lukashenko, these days allows the occupying troops to enter our land. As part of the Peklo cyber campaign, we encrypted the bulk of the servers, databases, and workstations of the rail network in order to slow down and disrupt the operation of the road. The backups have been destroyed. Dozens of databases have been cyber attacked, including uh, a bunch of stuff that I'm not going to list. Automation and security systems were deliberately not affected by a cyber attack in order to avoid emergency situations. And Russia has been using Belarus's railways to transport troops and equipment, so this is a very targeted attack. It's also highly unusual, since ransomware is usually just used for financial gain and not as a tool in what's essentially a revolutionary struggle. Um, it's a bit of a taste of Russia's own medicine, since they have spent the last several years hacking and tampering with Ukraine's public services to intimidate them against getting too cozy with the EU and NATO. Uh, they shut off an entire city at one point. Yeah, they've, uh, they've shut down, like, the grid. So it turns out, two can play at that game. Uh, it's unclear just how inconvenienced Belarus's rail system is by all this, but there's likely going to be plenty more where that came from. And again, if you want to be absolutely horrified, but very informed about all of this taking place around the world, specifically between the United States, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, uh, the and, UAE. and the UAE. Uh, you should, it's a very big book, but it is, you'll read it very fast because it's yeah. super interesting and scary. Uh, it's called This Is How They Tell Me The World Ends, and it's all about from the beginning yeah, to it's, now. It does the, the history of what's essentially an arms race that most people aren't even aware of, yes. which is like cyber weapons. It's like, Going back to even the late 90s, like it was just a completely different ecosystem. And because countries like the U.S. realized like, oh, we should buy these zero day exploits from these hackers to use them in our cyber attacks. They they created an arms race where you know, the attacks are worse and worse and worse. And, and then, oops, uh, sometimes those zero days then, get out yeah, uh, and leaks sometimes, to everyone. Sometimes the NSA's uh, big old pot of exploits gets leaked and spread around the world. To and, where anyone uh, can use them. Yeah, sometimes uh, horrible things happen. Uh, but yeah, it's super interesting. It's a, it's a, it's not a fun read, but it is a, you, it's hard to put down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so definitely recommend that book. Uh, the audiobook version is great too. I read the words on the page. I did a mix, a mix of both. <laughs> I subsequented the, uh, the book in bed with the audiobook in the car. Oh. So. Anyway, moving on now, uh, hacking isn't always just in the computer. Yeah. A lot of hacking is really just social engineering or simply just paying attention to things that your victims don't think anyone will notice. And that's the case with a woman in Germany who seems to have uncovered an entire secret German intelligence agency for the cost of an Apple AirTag. So activist researcher Lilith Whitman recently came across an entry for Germany's federal telecommunications service in an old federal directory. But the German Federal Telecommunications Service does not exist, or does not seem to. There's no word of it anywhere else, just on this old government database. So mm. she covers her journey of trying to figure out just what exactly the Federal Telecommunications Service is on her Medium blog, but here's Apple Insider summing things up. Some of the steps she details are no longer possible to reproduce, such as her initial one of simply looking up a list of federal authorities online. Similarly, Whitman includes transcripts of phone calls with an official whose cell number that she reports then ceased working. Through calls like that, IP searches, and even driving to official buildings, Whitman worked to track down the mysterious Bundesservice Telecommunication, or Federal Telecommunications Service. She establishes multiple reasons to believe it is part of the Federal Ministry of the Interior, BMI, and ultimately concludes that there are actually two camouflage authorities. Both are allegedly a secret part of an intelligence agency named the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution. It continues, Whitman says that everyone she spoke to denied being part of this intelligence agency, but what she describes as a good indicator would be if she could prove that the postal address for this federal authority actually leads to the intelligence service's apparent offices. Quote, to understand where mail ends up, she writes, in translation, you can do a lot of manual research, or you can simply send a small device that regularly transmits its current position, a so-called air tag, and see where it lands. So she sent a parcel with an air tag and watched through Apple's Find Me system as it was delivered via the Berlin Sorting Center to a sorting office in Cologne-Ehrenfeld. 
and then appears at the office for the protection of the Constitution in Cologne. So an air tag addressed to a telecommunications authority based in one part of Germany ends up in the offices of an intelligence agency based in another part of the country. Whitman's research is also now detailed in the German Wikipedia entry for the Federal Telecommunications <laughs> Service. It recounts how following her original discovery in December 2021, subsequent government press conferences have denied that there is such a Federal Telecommunications Service at all. Hmm. So that's sketchy as hell and seems to indicate that despite what the German government claims, the Federal Telecommunications Service does exist and is in fact a front for a government intelligence agency. The Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution is sort of the German version of the NSA. So this would be similar to mailing an air tag to a mysterious U.S. government agency listed as being in Washington, D.C., and then having it end up in Fort Meade, Maryland, where the NSA is located. Except with way more distance between yeah, the two. Yeah, Berlin and Cologne are not yeah. close. <laughs> now, now, what's especially hilarious about all this, though, is that this information was just sitting out there for an entire decade until one person was feeling petty enough to spend 35 euros plus shipping to look into it. Yeah. So, hiding in plain sight. Yep. Uh, I got least, time. At least this is a fun one because all the uh, air tag related crimes in, uh, or like crimes. Stalking and shit yeah, like that. Tossing it into putting in women's their, bags. Put it in their bumper or something. Yeah. Like, tape it to their car. Fucked up. Yeah. They have a uh, feature now it, that. It, uh, it does. A, it makes a sound, I think. They have a feature now that sh that'll ping you on your phone to tell it, you that there oh, is an air tag that doesn't belong to you that's f going, traveling with you. But if I don't have an, an iPhone, which I don't. Well, I buddy, I guess you should join the security revolution. Yeah, you better do it. Yeah. This is Android's fault. <laughs> this is absolutely Android's this is fault. Android's fault. Why, yeah. Why would you blame Apple? For uh huh. This? Yeah. Anyways, finally, quick little update to a story from our last episode. Neil Young told Spotify to please remove his music since he didn't want his songs to be on a platform that pays Joe Rogan $100 million to spread vaccine misinformation. And Spotify has gone ahead and done just that. Or rather, Neil Young told Spotify that they can have either Neil or Joe, and they chose Joe. Mm -hmm. But it's unlikely that Neil Young actually thought that Spotify would drop Joe Rogan just because he asked them to. He wanted out, he gave them the ultimatum, so it would be Spotify chooses Joe Rogan over Neil Young instead of simply Neil Young leaves Spotify. Yes. And hey, good for him. Neil Young survived polio just a couple years before a vaccine was available and has some justifiably strong opinions about vaccine misinformation. If he doesn't want to share a platform with the world's most prominent vaccine skeptic, that is absolutely his right. And he clearly doesn't give much of a shit about what, whatever revenue that he's losing from Spotify, a platform notorious for shortchanging artists while spending obscene, obscene amount of money on podcast exclusivity deals. Uh, will other artists follow suit? Maybe, maybe not. But most artists don't have Neil Young's pristine, half-century record of principled stances on all sorts of issues. The activism section of his Wikipedia is as long as the section on his music career, and he's probably perfectly happy with how this turned out for him, especially because it all happened on the day that Jordan Peterson appeared on Rogan's podcast wearing dressed, a suit. Dressed like a, a magician, a birthday party magician. Yes. Wearing a tuxedo, not yeah. just a suit, a tuxedo. Yeah. I, there was the, the great tweet that I saw that was just like, ah, yes, me dressing like this to go have a conversation with my yeah. friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I dress when I go to have a conversation with my friends. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, people are like, oh, man, Neil Young, like, he done goofed. It's like, no, he knew this was going to factor. Also, happen. he doesn't care. He, he sold the rights to his, I, I looked it up, it was like 50%. Yeah. For $150 million. Yeah. He's, uh, and again, like, uh, he's probably losing a decent amount of money, but Spotify doesn't pay its artists well. It has, like, the lowest CPMs of any he of the He doesn't need the money either. It's yeah. much more beneficial for him to take an actual stance on this. And yeah. he's already obscenely wealthy. Yeah. So it's like, He'll be this fine. is a win-win for him. I was, it did make me sad because this morning when I saw the news, I went to Spotify and I was like, no, it's all still there. All my saved songs are there. But like, as I would tap on the songs, it would play like half a second of the audio and then just vanish each one by one. It's like when you're watching a YouTube video that gets struck while you're watching it. Yeah, it's like that. It's gone. <laughs> Where, am I losing it? Am I going crazy? Didn't these guys upload this video a couple days ago? <laughs> uh, speaking of which, uh, uh, we we pitched the TikTok on the last one. We're Thank on you. TikTok now. Thank you for uh, uh, joining us over there. Uh, it's just a test to see if it even works. Uh, so far, it's been uh, the comments of uh, people figuring out that we still do a show are incredible. So it looks like it's working. <laughs> but we just did have a uh, I put up a, a throwback clip, uh, yeah. which is the furries saving someone. Uh, and oddly enough, I was like, why can't I share this? Why is this video not appearing anywhere? Uh, and it was under review for like five to ten minutes before going live. So they're, uh... Your social credit score has lowered. <laughs> 
I can no longer, because of our TikTok account, enter any public transportation. Yeah, you can't ride in... the trains, the, the bullet trains from Beijing. Sorry, you're going to have to take a bus. I'm going to have to walk to the Olympic Village. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, our, our TikTok is, uh, I don't even know how Internet to Internet Today it. TV. Yeah, at Internet Today TV. There's a link in yeah. the description. Uh, you'll find it. You'll find it. Thank or you. Or for... you won't. Or you don't give a yeah, shit. Yeah, don't download the app to just to follow. If you're already on there. That's what I keep it's saying. It's all stuff that we do on here. You're already seeing just it. Just over there and vertical. It's not for you. Yeah. But you can help us by liking it. Yeah. Anyways. Tell your teenage uh, cousins, like, hey. These, What's up, teens? These cool guys that uh, just appeared on TikTok. You guys finna find some new channels on TikTok? Dab. Check out Internet Today TV. They're... Have you seen uh, the Duolingo TikTok? I'll show you after this. They talk about drinking piss and stuff. I'll, I'll show you. Anyways, uh, that's it for today's episode. If you haven't already, uh, we did a video about Joe Biden uh, calling someone a bitch. Or, and, uh, or a son of a bitch, and uh, also about World War III, which we mentioned in this episode. And if uh, you haven't seen Weekly Weird News yet, go ahead and check out some Italian Senate hentai. Yeah. There you go. Bye. Bye.